Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged. Good morning, church. You say good morning. good morning. There you go. Good holiday weekend morning, end of the summer. Some of you may be not ready to see it go. I live in a life of fall. I love the fall. A little less sweating going on. Not today. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to read some scripture as we start this morning. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. And it says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depth, the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the sunshine, for your creation for the ability to read your scripture and to stand firm in your word, the beauty of praising your name. God, we thank you for all these beautiful people. We pray for the kids as they head back to school this week. Uh, all those parents say amen. Uh, thank you, God, for who you are and how you, you, you love us, you pursue our hearts. And uh, yeah, thank you, God. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us as we worship this morning. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross Truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would. Oh 
sing for all that you've done for me.
probably some people whose this is your cry this week. Whatever it is, whatever it was that's going on this week, I feel like for some of us, this is our cry this week. That we would just say, God, we're so desperate for more of you. We're so desperate for your presence. We're so desperate for your love. We're so desperate for your grace, for your mercy. Whatever it might be, I just feel like in this room, there's some people this morning who need to just take a moment and declare this with what they've got. With whatever it is that you have to bring before God this morning, that we just would declare it that we would just sing it out until it would become true in our heart and in our soul and in our spirit. So I'm going to invite you, if that's you, let's not miss this moment to press into God. Let's not miss this moment to press into what he has for us this morning or what he has for you right exactly where you are. I'm just going to invite you. We're going to sing one more time, and I'm desperate for you. And for God, I, and so God, I pray that for every person in this room who this is the reality, that God, we're just desperate for more of your presence. We're just desperate for more of your love. We're desperate for more of your grace and your mercy. That God, you would just meet us where we're at this morning. That as we cry out our heart, as we sing out our heart to you, God, that you would hear what we have. And God, that you would pour your love and your grace and your mercy over us this morning. Come on, church, I invite you to sing. Just where you are, just lift your voice this morning.
So God, this morning we pray. Oh Jesus, we pray across this room that we would be a church and a generation and that we would be generations who are desperate for more of you, who are desperate for more of your heart and your presence. Lord God, I pray this morning that you would speak to us and meet us exactly where we are. God, that you would come and that you would be here, God, and more importantly, that our hearts and our eyes and our ears would be open to what you have for us. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Come on, everybody said, amen, amen. Why don't you go? Thank you, Pastor Ty. I appreciate that. It is exciting for me to be here because I get the opportunity to start a new series. Uh, for those who are here for the first time or haven't been for a little while, we were going through a series all about God's parables all throughout Matthew and his lessons in kingdom living. And there were some really incredible opportunities to hear his wisdom and how God was able to teach through some of the most basic ideas and images. But it naturally kind of sprung right into where we're going now, which is picking back up our series on Revelation. We had done the beginning portion of Revelation last year, and that was looking at the seven churches. And for the sake of a little bit of fun, I'm curious to know how many of you retained any information. So this will be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to do a quick review, and I'd love to know, without showing up on the screen, do you remember any of the names of the seven churches? Any of the names of the seven churches. So who thinks they have one of the church names? What's that? Ruth? Yeah, Pergamus or Pergamum. Very good. That's great. Okay. No, no. Close, though. Very close. There's one that sounds like that. Sean? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Very close, right? Very close. Ben? Yeah, Laodicea. Perfect. That's three of the seven already done. Mina? Thyatira, very good. Okay, we got four. Okay, Ty's got his hand up. We'll come back to Ty. Sue, go ahead. Sardis, very good. I love that. That's the one that I always forget. We got five of the seven. There's another two left. Does anyone remember the last two or one of the last two? Smyrna, very good. Now, the only one that's left is the one that is the most obvious, the one that I always remember. This is... Ephesus, very good. That is all seven of the churches. You have officially graduated the first portion of Revelation. Now, it was really interesting because from this, we were able to understand different things. Jesus came to, to John and brought this wonderful and simple teaching to all the churches. And he made it specifically for them. And he gave them all encouraging messages. Like Ephesus was, you need to get back to your first love. You started off so strong, but you've kind of started to wane. So get back to your first love. Smyrna was, you know what? You're richer than you think. You're bigger and better than you realize because God is working in you and through you. Also great things for us to remember. Pergamum had a little bit more of an interesting. It says, you've remained loyal, but you're not done yet. You've remained loyal, but you're not finished yet. So keep running that race. Thyatira was... Be very, very careful of this individual in your midst. They refer to her as a Jezebel. This is a very dangerous false teacher. You're doing great, but be careful about giving this person too much authority because she's taking you away. Sardis was very simple. Wake up. You have fallen asleep. You are sitting in your brand new comfortable church chairs and you're getting a little too comfortable. You gotta wake up and live out your faith. Philadelphia is great. I will reward your obedience. You have been good and you've continued to push through even when you didn't feel like you had anything left to give. And I'll reward your obedience. And then the last one is Laodicea. I would prefer if you are hot or cold, but stop being lukewarm in your faith. Because when everything is lukewarm, that's where everything just disappears. It means you're not making any type of a stance or a choice, hot or cold. Those are the seven churches in a quick paraphrase. So for everyone who was not there for the series, you are semi-caught up. Semi-caught up. There's a little bit more to it, but that gives you a, a brief overview. The other thing that we need to recognize, too, is Revelation is one of, if not the most, conflicted books of the Bible. There are so many theories and opinions on what it's saying to us, what it means, what John originally meant for the purpose of it, what Jesus meant by the original message, and does it even apply today? 
or even better, is it all for today and the future? Does none of it apply to the history of when it was originally written? It's all speaking about what is coming and what is to come. Now, there are many different ideas of what Revelation means and what it's communicating. But today, I want to talk to you about where the chapter and the vision starts to shift. It goes from the churches, the seven churches, which are kind of here, that Jesus says in the language, what you see and where you are. And then he switches to something very different. And the theme for today is, as it is in heaven. And John gets this new revelation from God that is totally out of this world. And I would love the opportunity to read it with you. And so we're going to be starting at Revelation 4. And for those who don't know, Revelation is the last book of the Bible, so it is the easiest to find. I always enjoyed when we had to do sword drills. And like, Revelation, I'm like, I've got that one down pat. So it starts off with Revelation 4, verses 1. It says, then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. Instantly, I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, And the glow of an emerald circle encircled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystals. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third was like a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept saying this, Holy, Holy Holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever these living beings gave glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they existed because you created what you pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is our passage we're going to be looking at today, and it is one of the most easiest things to understand, right? You read that once, and you're like, oh, perfect. I know exactly what Jesus was trying to communicate here. The first time I read this, I was like, oh, my goodness. I am trying to figure out what is the big idea What is the major teaching from this? And so I do what I always do. I went and did a bunch of research and reading. And guess what I figured out? Pretty much every single book I read had a different idea, a different theory, and a different opinion. Now, they all agreed on something, which is what we're going to be getting to today. But they all had different theories and opinions on what we're going to be looking at. But what I I first want to start to look at with you here is verse 1 is the setting for this. After John had done the letters to the seven churches, there is original language that doesn't really fully encapsulate it in the New Living Tradition, but it says, then, then. It actually signifies that there is another revelation happening. This is another vision that came from Jesus. He saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice he had heard before, which communicated the original message to the seven churches, sounded like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. So what's interesting within this passage is, first of all, where it's happening. We know it's happening in heaven. It says language like, there was a door in heaven. Come up here. I have something to show you. So it's communicating right now the idea that this is not of this world. John is going to a whole different place. 
It says he's in the spirit suddenly. Is he actually physically taken out of his body and brought up to heaven? Or is he just given vision? We don't know exactly. It just says he's taken up to the place where he's in the spirit. And he's able to now see something that's not of this world. Now what's interesting with that is it says a voice spoke like a trumpet blast. There are a lot of people who say, oh, the trumpet blast is referencing the rapture, and it means John is like the church and he's being brought up to the throne of God. But it doesn't reference anywhere after this in Revelation that the church is present, or the redeemed are present. It doesn't bring any reference to that. So that's a good theory, but again, we don't know. And then it says something interesting. The voice says, come up here, I'll show you what must happen after this. What is the this that it's referencing? Are you referencing the letters to the seven churches? Are you referencing after this vision what is still to come after? Are you referencing what is about to happen once John steps through that heavenly door? Again, there is no clarity brought for that. It just gives us a hint that what John is about to see is something that is going to happen. Happen in God's time. We have theories on when that is. Most of us like to fit everything on a calendar and say, okay, God, you're gonna do this and then this and then this. And I expect this to be done by this time, this to be done by this time, and this to be done by this time. And when you do all of that, then I will be happy with you again. That never works. God's will is greater than our will and his plans are perfect. And heaven's time is very different than ours. There's so many times in the Bible references God doing something. And he says, okay, it's going to happen in seven years. It's going to happen in 40 days. It's going to happen in a thousand years. But then we look at the Bible and says, okay, but a minute to God is like a thousand years. When you put that in perspective, he may very well be talking to us by heaven's time. But based on earthly time, we have no clue what that is going to look like. It could be a 1,000 years. It could be 10,000 years. It could be two days. The point is God's plan is in place and it will come to fruition. And he has a plan for when it needs to happen. So that's the start of it. And there are so many different things you can do. If you do studies from Revelation, this is my warning to you now. There are so many different theories and opinions out there. Some of them are very well researched. Some of them are not. Some of them come from people sitting in their grandparents' or their parents' basement, and they have a little bit too much tinfoil on their head. And they're like, this is exactly what it is. Some of them, they've actually done extensive research on it. But they, again, are like, I don't know what Jesus is saying. I have theories, but I don't know what. So that's where we're going to be starting. Next, I want to focus on three elements of this passage. There are many things that we could look at. We could study the meaning of the gemstones. We could study the meaning of the rainbows. A lot of people believe it's a reference to the rainbow that was promised after the flooding of the earth, the Noahic covenant, if you will, but we don't know that yet. The three things I want to focus on today is the first thing is the VIP of the story. Who is the center of this story? Everything revolves around one thing in heaven. And if you look at how everything is laid out, It all revolves around one individual. Verse three says, the one sitting on the throne was brilliant as a gemstone. Like Jasper and Carnelian, the glow of an emerald encircled his throne like a rainbow. All of that glow is all around his throne. 24 thrones surrounded him, all surrounding him. And 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their head. From this same throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. In front of that throne were seven torches with burning flames, the sevenfold spirit of God. And then inside of that were also these four living beings. Everything is encircling the throne of God. Everything is focused on him. The first thing that John sees and what everything else is focused on is the throne of the father. And all of heaven is fixated on him. All of heaven is fixated on him. Whenever we have any type of a social gathering, there's usually someone that's being honored or referenced. When someone's having a birthday, 
you don't pay attention to everyone else but the birthday boy. That would not go over well at all. When someone is having an anniversary, you pay attention to that couple. When someone graduates, you honor them. The whole point of the focus is on them. Heaven is literally one incredible celebration of worship, all focused on the Father. He is the most important part of the book of Revelation. He is the most important part of our faith. And guess what? The Father has included the Holy Spirit in his throne and the Son. Now, the Son we will actually be able to see in Revelation Five, that's still coming. But right now we know that there is the seven lamps in front, which symbolize the sevenfold spirit of God. If you have done any research on Revelation, the number seven is used a lot. There are seven churches, seven stars, seven lamps, sevenfold spirit of God. Then you have to wait seven times of 70 years. God uses the word seven and the number seven over and over again because it's the meaning of completeness and perfection. And here he's saying this is the perfect and full spirit of God right in front of him. So now we understand the whole point of Revelation is fixed on the Father. The next thing I want to bring your attention to is some very interesting friends. The Father is there, but then he surrounds himself with 24 other thrones. And on these 24 other thrones are 24 elders. He has a party in heaven that we already know, based on other references, has millions and millions and millions of angels. But he's focusing on 24 different elders. Now, we don't know exactly who these people are. We know they're dressed in white, which symbolizes purity. They symbolize something that has been cleaned. We know they have crowns on their head, which symbolizes some form of dominion and authority. They have been given a position of power. Now, who are the 24 elders? One of the commentaries I read said they're another group of angels, like the living beings. They're another group of angels. Another commentary that I read actually said, no, the number 24 is very symbolic, Because there's actually 24 sects or different parts of the priesthood. If you guys want to look that up, it's in 1 Chronicles. But it's all about this idea of there's 24 different sections of the priesthood that God made with the Levites. So it's referencing these are the priests of heaven. I'm like, that's a cool idea. Another interesting theory that I love, though, was someone said, no, 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 the number 24 is very symbolic because it represents the old covenant and the new covenant. It's the 12 tribes of Israel added with the 12 apostles or disciples of Jesus. And you know what? The more I did research on that, the more I discovered something. I think I prefer this answer because there's another passage that comes up that I think would be very revealing for us. And that's in Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, 12 to 14, it says that when the new Jerusalem is revealed, which is the new holy city that God made, on the gates are inscribed the 12 names of the tribes of Israel. And on the foundation walls of that city will be inscribed the 12 names of the apostles of Jesus. Like, okay, there's reference in more places than one of these 12 and 12 combined to 24. This is like heavenly mathematics here. This is fantastic. I was like, this is where I guess I become a little bit more of a Bible geek. I'm like, I didn't realize there was so much of these intricate things inside of Revelation. But it's very unique to know that God's throne is surrounded by these 24 elders. And what their job and what their task is, we will get to that in just a moment. The next thing that I want to bring your attention to are these interesting creatures. Jesus surrounds his throne by some interesting friends and some interesting creatures. Just listen again to the description of these beings and imagine yourself as John. You come up for the first time. You see heaven. Everything in heaven is perfect and beautiful. There is an emerald 
ring like a rainbow. There is jewels and gems. There's a perfect glassy lake in front of you. And then you see these four living beings. One of them looks like it is a lion. That's majestic with wings, even better. One of them looks like it is actually an eagle in flight, also with wings. That's something we can relate to. Another looks like it's a human with wings, like most pictures of angels. Okay, John is still in place of awe and majesty. One looks like an ox with wings. Those better be really, really strong wings. Okay, but at the same time, this is still beautiful and majestic. And then he looks at them and sees that they're covered with eyeballs. Of all the things to see, all of the wings and all the creatures are covered with eyes from front to back. Just imagine for a moment what that must be like. Now, in my brain, I naturally think of these eyeballs moving all the time, which just makes it even more disturbing. These creatures are majestic and awesome and at the same time awful. If I was John, I would be in a place where I'd be like, what just happened? And out of all the things that God wants around his throne... Remember, the 24 elders that seem semi-normal are on the outside ring. These four beings are on the inside ring, which means God, when he looks around, he's seeing these beings all the time and all of these eyes looking back at him. That's a little disturbing. Why would God want this to be the creature surrounding his throne? Again, I went back to the books, did research after research after research, and the best that I could find out is it's like John, when he's trying to describe it, he's using the language that he knows. There is Ezekiel, there is Isaiah, there are Daniel. All of these other three prophets were given a similar vision where they were brought up to heaven. And when they did, they encountered angelic beings. Now, what's interesting with these angelic beings is that Isaiah recorded them as seraphim. Ezekiel said, no, no, they're cherubim. They're something similar but different. Some of them have four wings. Some of them have four heads. Some of them are majestic. But the incredible thing with all of them is they all seem to have a similar purpose and value. Everything they do is focused on God. Everything they're doing is worshiping him. Now, I am a very visual person. In order to understand some of what this looks like, I went through and tried to find some art that I could share with you that would be not too disturbing, because if you give credit to like the AI stuff, they really do a good job of making things very intense. But I went back to like old school, and I found an interesting painting by William Blank. This is a watercolor that I want to show you of what heaven could have looked like. So he has the four creatures on either side. He has the elders around. He has the elders around and underneath. He has the rainbow over top. And the rainbow actually eventually in the whole picture encircles. Encircles the whole throne. Imagine you were John. You're given a vision. You come into heaven and you see this. What would be your natural reaction? I think there's a reason why every time in the Bible people encounter God or angels or a messenger, their first instinct is terror. They are just terrified. And God has to come up and be like, don't be afraid. Fear not. It's okay. I know it's a lot to think about. I know, I know you're not used to it. But this isn't actually a bad thing. It's just an awesome thing. It is so over. Overwhelming to think that we serve a God whose power and creation is infinitely more than we know. We see this earth the way it is, and it already is enough to overwhelm us. How many of you have ever seen a beautiful sunset? Show of hands. How many of you have ever seen a beautiful sunrise? That's probably less people. Okay, how many of you have ever done some type of hiking and explored and seen beautiful mountains with valleys? How much does nature take your breath away? And these are the things that we have here on earth. Heaven is a whole nother story. And a lot of what was communicated to John was done in a way that he would understand. 
God was using images and language that would make sense to him. Yes, part of it was heavenly, but part of it was more. The seven lamps were symbolized in the exact same temple. The glassy lake and sea that's there would be like the laver inside of the temple. God is trying to communicate that what is happening in heaven is actually the full and perfect model of what John had down on earth with the temple as the place of God. It symbolized where God hung out, where his presence was on earth. And what God was showing to John is my presence on earth was there and real, but it wasn't like it was in heaven. It required something greater to bring my presence like like it was in heaven. Many of you know the story because we've already learned when Christ died, the curtain, the veil that was separating the Holy of Holies tore and God's presence became accessible for all people. And then he gives us a purpose over and over for his disciples to bring his kingdom here on earth like it is in heaven. One of the ways we do that is by learning what this image, this vision communicates, the true purpose of heaven. So my question to you now is, as we're going through, what is being communicated here? What's happening here? What is the big idea? What's the main point, if you will? Because we believe that all of this has something that's central for us to hold on to. I believe that the major idea is communicated clearly if we know where to look. The second part of verse 8 says, Day after day, night after night, they kept saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The one who always was, who is, and is still to come which is almost identical to Isaiah's experience with the seraphim who said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. It is all an ongoing activity of worshiping God. But whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the 24 elders cannot help themselves. They have to echo. This is literally a heavenly liturgy. The beings give a call, the elders give a response. The beings give a call, the elders give a response. So when they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and is still to come, the elders say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Then they bow down and surrender their crowns to God. And this happens day after day, and night after night. The whole time John is there, this is an ongoing, continual activity of God being worshipped. And notice, it never says they grumble or they complain. It says they do it with everything in their being. They worship God. And guess what? The four creatures... It's interesting how most people identify these four creatures as symbolizing creation. The lion represents all that is wild in the world, all the wild creation. The ox represents all that was domesticated. The eagle represents the birds of the air and the creatures of the unknown. And the man represents all of humanity. All of creation is worshiping God. Worshiping God like it was created to. The Bible is full of references of how creation was made to honor and worship God. And if we don't cry out, then rocks will cry out. All of creation is groaning and anxiously waiting for God to be honored and glorified. Creation was made to achieve this purpose. And the elders are the ones who show us how we as humanity have a part in this. When creation cries out in worship to God, our mission is to respond. Because creation, everywhere you look, is honoring God. The problem is we as humanity have stopped responding. We've missed our part. So creation keeps going over and over and over again, but there's no response. There's no reaction from us to do what we were created for. We were created to worship and honor God. That is our being. That is our purpose. In heaven, 
is where it's realized and where it's perfected and shown to John and all of the people who read this after what our purpose is all about, how we're called to have greater purpose. How are we worshiping God? The big part of this story, the major thing for us to recognize is that everything and everyone is worshiping God. All creation is honoring and worshiping him. It is incredible for us to recognize that we have a part to play in that. But if we're being honest, how many of us are able to recognize, first of all, that we have a trouble with worshiping other idols? We have problems with getting other things in our life that take the place of God. Where do we spend our time and our attention? Where do we spend our money? Where do we actually give our passions to? Is it to God or is it to other things in our life? We are having trouble with who we're worshiping. The next problem is we're having trouble with how we're worshiping. Yeah, I give God time every single week. I give God at least an hour on Sunday. That's a big sacrifice. And God goes, no, 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 you don't understand. I've created you for the purpose of worship. So what are you doing with the other 23 hours of Sunday? What are you doing with the other six days of the week? If that's all you're giving God is worship, we're missing the point. Day and night, night and day, these creatures are continually crying out to God in worship over and over and over again. So my question to us today is, can our worship here and now be as it is in heaven? Can we worship God like the models that we've been given the same way as these living beings and these redeemed elders? The good news is when we fall short, God is gracious and patient with us because if we lived according to our own desires and God's judgment was harsh and quick, I don't think this church would have many people in it, myself included. But God is patient and gracious with us and says, I'm inviting you into heaven's song. I am giving you an invitation to be a part of that too. So can we make our worship here now be as it is in heaven? I want to invite uh, Laura and the worship team to come back up. I'd like to do such an awesome God because that's the song that actually has that strong declaration of worship. Worship to the Father in this case. We're going to be getting to the Son. Don't worry. He's coming. But in this case, it is worship to the Father. And I'd love to be able to honor our God who is majestic and holy. As they lead us, I would love for you to take an opportunity to assess your heart and do something revolutionary. In this three minutes, roughly, I'm going to time that, of course, three minutes that we are singing this song, in this two to three minutes, can I actually worship like they worship in heaven? Because if I can't do it now in a safe place of church for three minutes, how am I supposed to do it with my life? May we worship God with our whole, our whole mind, our whole strength, everything we have to offer. May our love flow forth. And if it means singing the words, I mean the song, that's great. If it means sitting down and praying, then do that. If it means focusing on God and surrendering to Him anew, then do that. But may you worship Him in these moments with everything, just like we were created to do. Let's worship together.
happenstance or by accident but because you are pleased with what you created Genesis records that you made things and you said it was good you made humanity and you said you were it was really good you were really content and happy God you created us for a purpose and a reason and you delight in us may we recognize your love your incredible providence God how you look over us you watch over us you are involved in our life a God who is greater than the entire universe and you care about us. May we never forget how incredible your love is and recognize that you are our creator and master. May we live to delight you. May we honor you and worship you with what we say and what we do, how we live our life. May our testimony be honoring to you. We ask and we pray for your help with this Holy Spirit because by ourself, we'll fall back into our old, our old habits, our sin and our flesh. But with you, we can understand God's direction and leadership and have the ability to walk in your strength. May we live differently. May what we do be a worship here on earth as it is in heaven. We ask and we pray for this today. And if you mean it, Say amen. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Oh, there is so much to this passage. There's so much that I, I had to skip over and not include just because it's impossible to go through all of Revelation in a short window. But the beautiful thing about it is God, who is intricate, who is majestic, who is all-powerful, has the ability to welcome us into his place. He invites people into heaven. He invites heavenly missions into our lives and gives us the option to do his work. And then says, now live differently. Live for something bigger than yourself. This is what we get to aspire to and do differently. So my prayer for us all today is taken actually from Revelations 5.13. My benediction says, may all our blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's worship like they do in heaven. And let's make an impact on a world who doesn't know how to take it, what this looks like or what it means. Let's make an impact by worshiping God. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship. May you continue to have incredible time together as we honor God by how we interact. Enjoy the treats at the cafe and the coffee and the drinks that are made. And I hope you have an amazing and a blessed week. And we look forward to seeing you next week for the second portion of this heavenly, incredible, worshipful experience. Thank you so much and God bless. Take care.